It's July 15, 2022. I'm Todd Dunn, and today I'm aboard my 1972 Allied Princess Catch Sequester. And what I want to do today is make another video in my buying an old fiberglass sailboat series. And in particular, I want to talk about maintenance. When you're thinking about buying an old fiberglass sailboat, that might be a consideration. Is the boat going to take more maintenance or less maintenance than a newer boat? Well, let's talk about that. Right off the top, I guess I'll try to answer that question. If the boat's in reasonably good shape, it's probably going to take about the same level of maintenance as a newer boat. If it's not in good shape, it might take more. Just depends on what needs to be done to it. Anyway, uh, before I say anything more about that, let's talk about what sort of maintenance we're talking about. Basically, what I'm going to be doing is talking about what I would consider annual maintenance and what I would consider sort of continuing maintenance. And we're going to break the boat up into a couple of different categories. Uh, interior systems is one category. The engine is another category. The hull is another category. And topside systems is another category. And finally, rig and sails. Okay, interior systems. What do they consist of? Well, interior systems is everything inside the boat exclusive of the engine. And, uh, you know, there'll be some maintenance there. Most of it is going to be related to whether or not you winterize the boat. And if you winterize the boat, you're also going to have to winterize some of the interior systems. And uh, mainly the water system and the head. Now if you have a water system on the boat and you do uh, live in a cold climate and you're going to want to winterize the water system well you need to do it what are the components of the water system first component the tank second component the plumbing might be hoses might if somebody's redone it be PEX and then the water heater uh, and finally the fixtures most older fiberglass sailboats are going to have at most three fixtures. A water tap in the galley, a water tap in the head, and if the boat has a second head, a water tap in the second head, and maybe a shower fitting. Winterizing the systems is not that difficult. It consists of emptying the water tank out, just drain it into the bilge, let the bilge pump, pump it over the side, and uh, then draining the water out of the water heater and modifying the plumbing so that the water, no water goes into the water heater. Just drain it and leave it open to the elements for the winter. And then take the hose that goes from the tank to the water pump and stick it in a bucket of non-toxic antifreeze and pump that through the system until you've had non-toxic antifreeze coming out of all of the faucets. When you're finished doing that, system is winterized. You will also want to winterize your head. Exactly how you do that is going to depend on the kind of head you have, but most older fiberglass sailboats probably have a mechanical head with a hand pump uh, that draws in water from somewhere outside the boat uh, or possibly uh, like mine it draws water in from uh, the head sink via the drain hose and so what I do to winterize my head is I close all the seacocks uh, pour some non-toxic antifreeze in the uh, head sink and then 
pump the non-toxic antifreeze through the system. Of course, before you do that, you want to make sure that your holding tank is pumped out. And ideally, when you pump the holding tank out, you want to pump it out, put some water in it, pump it out again, maybe do that a couple times if you, if you can where you're doing your pump out. And uh, then when you winterize the head, the non-toxic antifreeze will go into the holding tank. And that should be most of the liquid that's in there. And the only other thing that I do to my water system before I haul out is I open all of the seacocks that go to the water system so that when the boat is hauled out, any water that's in them drains out. Now, if you're winterizing the boat and are going to leave it laid up at the dock for the winter, you're also going to have to winterize those seacocks and quality seacocks have drain fittings on them. So what you do is close the seacock, open the drain, and it will let the water out of the seacock. Once all the water is run out, close it up, and you're done. Run your bilge pumps to get any water that got into the bilge out, and you're pretty much finished. Some people will pour a couple gallons of non-toxic antifreeze into the bilge, hopefully to prevent freezing there. That's pretty much winterizing your systems. It might be a little more involved if your boat is a fancy one and has something like reverse cycle air conditioning. Uh, you'll have to winterize that system as well because those are, of course, water cooled. But uh, the process is not that difficult. You basically just have to disconnect the inlet hose, put it in the non-toxic antifreeze, and run it through the system. Okay, that's pretty much the major maintenance that you're going to have to do to systems inside the boat. Now, periodically, you might have to do things like replace uh, a light element, an LED and a light, maybe, if one goes bad. But that's, uh, that's not really a big deal, and if you'd have to do that on any boat. Okay, what about another system that's in the boat that's not actually the engine? The batteries. Well, depending on the kind of batteries you have, you may have to do something, or you may have to do nothing. If you have flooded lead-acid batteries, maintenance on them uh, each year, particularly if you're in a cold climate and the boat is not going to be used uh, for the winter, uh, is to check the water in them, pop the caps off, have a look, add water if necessary, distilled water, and uh, make sure the batteries are fully charged before the winter season. Now, some people actually take the batteries off the boat and take them home. Uh, I don't because it's a lot of work. Batteries are heavy. And if they're fully charged, uh, even here in Maine, where it gets down to below zero, the batteries will not freeze and they will not discharge that much over the course of the winter because the rate of self-discharge goes down the colder they get. So that is, they're not a big problem. On the other hand, if you have sealed batteries, uh, AGM batteries, or gel batteries, maintenance consists of nothing. They're sealed. You can't do anything to them. But the only thing you might want to do is have a look at the connections. Make sure they're, they're tight and clean. Other than that, there's nothing to do. Now, I have one other electrical component that does require a little bit of uh, maintenance before I put this boat to, away for the winter, and that's my solar system. I have a couple of solar panels on the cabin top, and they're wired to a solar charge controller that's wired to the batteries. Now, if I just do nothing, when this boat goes into the shed, that solar charge controller consumes a little bit of energy no matter what, and over the course of the winter, it will draw my batteries down quite a bit. Uh, even 100 milliamps or whatever it is, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for six months is a pretty big total amp hour draw. So I uh, have a very simple solution to that. I have two switches, one that disconnects the solar panels from the charge controller. I turn it off and one that disconnects 
the batteries from the charge controller and I turn it off last. And at that point, that system won't draw my batteries down. And uh, if, however, you're storing your boat in the water and you have a solar system, leave it on because it will keep your batteries charged up over the course of the winter. Just hold them at float all winter, which will make them last longer. Okay, the next big thing is the engine. And the engine has a number of routine maintenance items on it. How often you do these maintenance items is going to depend on how much you use the boat. But for most of us who don't motor around a lot, these are once a year things. And the main ones are change the oil and filter. Uh, once a year, maybe once every two years, depending on how, how much you use the boat, change the on engine fuel filter. Now, in most setups, the on engine fuel filter is a secondary fuel filter. The primary is uh, an outside fuel filter, outside the engine that is, and uh, it will do most of the filtration and only what gets past it will contaminate your on engine fuel filter. Uh, so what I do is I change my primary fuel filter, which is a Raycor 500, I change the element in that every year. That takes about 10 minutes. And then I'm done. And that protects the on-engine fuel filter and lets it last for, I think I do it on about a three-year basis. But we don't motor a lot in this boat. If you motored 100 hours a year, you might want to do it every other year. If you motor 200 hours a year, you probably want to change that on engine filter every year. And you're probably going to change the oil twice a year. Okay, what else is there on the engine? Well, the next thing that you want to do on the engine is check the zinc in the heat exchanger for the cooling system. And you don't want to just check it. Cooling system zincs are cheap, just put a new one in. Cost five bucks. And it's just a, usually a quarter inch pipe thread fitting. You just unscrew it, put a new one in. No big deal. The only issue with it is that usually the heat exchanger uh, zinc is in a really, really awkward spot to get to, to work on. So that may be a, a bit of a challenge, but it's not a big job once you get in there with a the wrench. It's 30 seconds to get the old one out, 30 seconds to put the new one in. The only other things you're going to want to do is just sort of general maintenance. Have a look at the engine, look for any sign of leaks anywhere, take a look at the hoses, make sure they're in good shape, and take a look at the fan belt, look to see if it's wearing noticeably and make sure it's adequately tight. Not too tight, but adequately tight. And if it's an issue, no, change it. Fan belts are not expensive. And finally, the last thing, if you have a heat exchanger cooled boat, is you will have an impeller pump that pumps raw water from outside the boat through the heat exchanger and out through the exhaust system. And you want to, at the very least, inspect that uh, impeller, they'll last for several hundred hours as long as you don't forget to open the seacock that uh, lets water into the boat to, for the cooling system. Uh, but if you don't ever run them dry, they'll last a long time. And I like to check mine every year. Just take the inspection plate off, have a look at it. If it looks like it's got a crack in a vein or something, I just use a couple screwdrivers, pop it out, and put a new one in, close it up. And then about every other year on my boat, because as I said, I don't motor much, I check the transmission. It's pretty simple. I just pull the dipstick out of it, which is screwed in, so you have to use a wrench, unscrew it, uh, measure the fluid, have a look at the fluid when it to pull the dipstick out. This boat's transmission uses automatic transmission fluid and it's red. So that fluid, if it's still nice and red and clean looking, no problem with it. If it's changed color, then you may have an issue and you probably want to change the fluid. 
And for most transmissions, that means pumping the fluid out and then putting new fluid in. Just make sure you know what fluid goes in. And that pretty much covers everything you really need to do on a modern, and by modern I mean post-1900, diesel engine. There isn't a lot to them that's, that requires maintenance. Mine does have one grease fitting on the fresh water pump that I give a few squirts of grease every year. Oh, and you probably, when the engine's been sitting for a while and is cold, want to pop open the uh, cap on the radiator or, or uh, antifreeze reservoir, stick an antifreeze tester in there, and check to make sure the antifreeze is still in good shape. I like to keep mine so that it's good down to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius. Same thing. Uh, that's a very quick check. Only takes a couple minutes. And so that's the engine. That is going to take you a few hours probably. Uh, mostly in changing the oil and the fuel filter. Uh, largely because oil and fuel filters tend to be in awkward places to work. And it also takes quite a while to drain oil out of one of these engines. Uh, and depending on how your engine is set up, you may actually have to pump the oil out through the dipstick tube. Anyway, that's the engine. So now we're finished inside the boat, and we've got to go outside the boat to take a look at things. Well, topsides maintenance. Topsides maintenance consists of two parts. One, inspections, just to make sure things are in good shape. Basically, you know, walk around up there, look at fittings, look at, uh, you know, the chain plates, look at uh, any other deck penetrations to see if there's any sign that the caulking may need refreshing. And for example, I uh, recalk my chain plates every year because they move and they can break the seal and then they'll leak. So just a matter of course, every year in the spring, I recalk the chain plates. It takes a little while. It's easier to do when the mast is off the boat. And uh, then, uh, you know, just look things over. Have a look at your running rigging. That's the lines up there your jib sheets, uh, main, main sheet. If you have a mizzen mast like I do, mizzen sheet, look at the overall condition of the lines. Are they dirty? You can take those lines home and uh, when your wife is out of town, throw them in a washing machine and wash them and that will clean them up quite a bit and soften them up too, make them be a lot nicer to handle. And uh, that brings me to the one potentially big topsides job, and that's varnish. If your boat and most older boats do have some teak on deck, cockpit combings, handrails, drop boards for the companionway, you know, a lot, little bits of trim here and there, maybe an eyebrow around the cabin house, maybe teak tow rails, you have to decide how you're going to maintain those. There are two options. You can let them go natural. In other words, <clears throat> if they don't have varnish on them, just let them go gray. Picture of an 80s vintage Sabre 34 where they have let the, var the teak go natural. And you can see the teak looks pretty weathered. And if you ran your hand over this teak, you could feel some raised grain in it. And... Uh, now, that wood will, over time, gradually deteriorate, and eventually, if you let it go natural for long enough, particularly in a hot, sunny climate, you'll probably end up having to replace it, which can be very, very expensive. But it's a decision you have to make. The other option is varnish. I've gone the varnish route here on Sequester, and the thing with varnish is... Uh, once you get your varnish built up and in good shape, keeping it that way is pretty easy. All you have to do is mask around the teak, 
sand the varnish, uh, usually with a 220 grit paper, or maybe use a coarse Scotch-Brite pad, and clean it up, slap a coat of varnish on. On my boat, I have uh, teak cockpit combings, I have teak uh, drop boards for the companionway, a teak uh, trim piece on the companionway slide, and I have two handrails on the cabin top. That's all the exterior wood I have to varnish. It takes probably two and a half hours to mask all of that wood. It takes about 30 minutes to sand it, and it takes about maybe 45 minutes to put a coat of varnish on. And I usually uh, put two coats on a year. If you live further south than I do, you might want to put three on. Pays to use a good quality varnish. Don't use spar urethane. That will not hold up. And go with a good quality varnish. I use Epiphane's Gloss. It's expensive. It costs about $40 a liter. But a liter lasts me a couple of years. So 20 bucks for varnish once a year is not that big a deal. Okay, and that's that's pretty much on deck. Check for possible leaks, rebed anything that you think needs it, and then uh, check out your running rigging, make sure it's in good shape, and then do whatever you're going to do to any on deck wood. And you have to make the decision. Do you want to go natural or do you want to go varnish and make it look shiny and potentially make the wood last a lot longer? Because one thing about varnish is once you've got it built up, uh, when you sand the uh, teak every year for the next coat of varnish, you're not sanding the wood. You're sanding the varnish. So the wood will stay in good shape, won't get worn down, and will just uh, and will last many, many years. All of the teak on the top sides of this boat is original. And it's, it's lasted for 50 years, and if I keep the varnish up, not that I'll last that long, it would last another 50 years. Okay, what's the next step? Well, depending on where you store and how you store in the winter, if you just leave the boat at the marina, uh, you're going to be a little less able to do this next step and if you but if you haul out and take the mast down this next step is pretty easy and that is inspect your standing rigging look at all the fittings just to make sure they don't show any signs of corrosion and uh, they don't have any cracks or other damage check out the wires, that 1x19 stainless steel wire, just to make sure that it, they look good. There aren't any broken strands anywhere. Uh, they're, they're not showing any corrosion or the wires aren't starting to expand a little bit perhaps if they were getting internal corrosion. So you want to you know, just look at them. If the mast is down, you can inspect the entire standing rigging from the mast head right down to the bottom. And uh, you can also do a much better job of inspecting the running rigging, the halyards, than you can with the mast up. But if the mast is up, well, if you don't, don't do anything except walk around and look, you can get maybe seven feet, maybe eight feet if you're a little taller than I am, up the wires at, on each wire and see what condition they're in. And if one thing about them, if you decide, for example, that you've got a cracked fitting on the port forward lower, you're going to have to replace that wire. And uh, if you replace a wire on the port side, I recommend very strongly that you replace the equivalent wire on the starboard side. And as far as replacing standing rigging goes, there are two ways to do it. You can hire a rigger to do it, who will come in, take the old wire off, build you a new wire, and then put the new wire onto the boat. Now, if you take your mast down every year, you can do the replacement yourself. You can take the wire off, you can measure it, 
and have a rigging company make you a new one, and which they can do very easily from the measurements. And most rigging companies that build wires will even tell you how to measure them. And you can then put the new wires on. It's very, very simple. And you'll save yourself a lot of money over hiring a rigger. Now, if the mast is up, it's different. Uh, I'm not a big fan of going up the mast, and uh, I don't have a problem of a rigger going up the mast. So you, it's probably worth it to pay a rigger to go up the mast if you store with your mast up in the winter. Okay, and the, have the rigger inspect everything else while they're up there. Now, sails. Sails are a maintenance item. And I'm going to include sail covers and any on-deck canvas, like your Dodger, in this item. Uh, because what you want to do is you want to take your sails, ideally, off the boat, take them home, wash them. I just uh, have a soft brush, six-foot handle on it, and use some mild detergent, spread them out on the lawn, hose them down, and then scrub them a little bit, clean them up. Uh, flip them over, do the other side, and rinse them off, and then let them dry. And while I'm doing that, I have a good look at the condition of the sails. And if there's anything that needs repair, uh, if it's small, I do it myself, hand stitch it. Uh, my sewing machine at home uh, can't handle sailcloth, but I have an awl and some thread and can uh, do short bits of uh, seams if anything needs a little bit of repair. If uh, it looks like you've got a big repair that you need to have done, well, you can take the sail after you've cleaned it up and send it to the local sail maker and have them fix it. If, you, if they don't have to clean the sail, that's really not that expensive. They're just going to charge you time and uh, materials and you can probably get some fairly significant repairs done restitching your sails, for example, for a couple hundred bucks. If you have the sail maker clean your sails, that will cost you four or five hundred dollars. So uh, unless you really want to go all out and have them professionally cleaned every year, uh, it's worth it just to do it yourself because that gives you the opportunity to have a close look at the condition of the sails at the same time. And do the same for your sail covers. Look them over. Look primarily at the stitching to see if it's holding up. If there are issues with the stitching, well, you can usually uh, restitch those yourself. If you have a, a sewing machine, they're just Sunbrella, which is a relatively easy fabric to sew. And uh, you get some UV stable thread uh, from a company like Sailrite and just sew them up. Doesn't take long at all. Or, if you don't sew, uh, you can send them off to the sail maker and, or local canvas shop and have them stitch them if they need it. And also, finally, look over your dodger. Uh, if you're going to store the boat, you're probably going to take the dodger off. It's a good idea to wash it down thoroughly with fresh water before you take it off. Make sure uh, all the windows and everything in it are nice and clean. Get everything as clean as you can. Let it dry thoroughly and then remove it and put it wherever you're going to store it for the off season. And that brings us to the last big maintenance item. That's the hull. The hull can be divided into two parts. Top sides above the waterline and below the waterline. And uh, it's relatively simple, although a uh, potentially hard work project to do the top sides. A lot of people like to keep those top sides shiny and looking very pretty, and that usually involves buffing and waxing the top sides, which can be a big job and it is definitely going to leave you with sore shoulders after running that buffer up there. Uh, while working on a ladder or maybe scaffolding uh, for at least a day. And uh, 
But that's pretty much all there is to the top sides. You can always inspect the top sides just to make sure that you didn't bump into anything and, and scar them up in, at all during the season and buff them out. And you might also want to take a look at any paint that's on the boat, uh, like your bootstripe. Bootstripes uh, periodically need re repairing and you might want to maybe repaint the bootstripe. I did it last year on this boat. It took longer to mask it than it did to sand and paint it. But so I masked it, sanded it, and put two coats of, uh, of paint on it and made a huge transformation in how the boat looks. Now, let's go below the waterline. What's the big thing there? Uh, the hull below the waterline has several features that you need to look at. Obviously, the biggest one, bottom paint. Now, if you haul out every year, that means you're probably going to bottom paint every year. We put our boats here in Maine in winter storage uh, on the hard every year, and every spring it's kind of a ritual to repaint the bottom. Now, depending on the bottom paint you use, that may involve sanding the hull, which is no fun, and then painting it with new bottom paint. If you use an ablative bottom paint, all you have to do is, when the boat is hauled out, have the yard pressure wash it, and then roll the new bottom paint on. Rolling bottom paint on is not particularly time consuming or difficult. My boat here, with a full keel, has a lot of surface area, uh, a 36-foot boat takes about three hours to paint the bottom. It takes about 45 minutes to mask uh, the bottom before I paint it. So, you know, it's not a huge job. You can usually do it in an afternoon. Okay, the other things you need to do down below are uh, clean up the prop. Uh, props often get some growth on them, some small barnacles or something like that. Scrape them off, clean the prop up. I uh, buff mine out every year to a nice uh, shine and replace the zincs down below the waterline. I have a shaft zinc. That's the only zinc on this boat that I replace. You might have others in other places, but if the boat's out of the water, replace them. They're cheap. They don't take long to replace, and they are good insurance. You'd much rather have a $15 zinc corrode away than your $2,000 uh, propeller shaft or the equivalent cost propeller. <laughs> so put those zincs, replace those zincs. And the only other thing that I do every year is as part of my hull maintenance, I climb back up inside the boat and I open and close all the seacocks a few times to make sure they're working properly. And while I'm at it, I inspect the hose clamps and the hoses just to make sure they're still in good shape. And then if you're hauling out and going to be stored out of the water, leave the seacocks open. That way you won't get any water built up in them that could freeze. And just remember that if there are any of them you want to close before you go back in to do that. Okay, that pretty much covers the normal maintenance on an old fiberglass sailboat. And frankly, if you had a brand new fiberglass sailboat, well, brand new to me means anything built after about 2000, uh, you're going to have to do pretty much the same thing. So the maintenance on an old fiberglass sailboat is really pretty much the same as the routine and continuing maintenance on a new fiberglass sailboat. So maintenance is not a reason to avoid buying an old boat because especially once you do it the first time and get everything caught up, maintenance is not that big a job. Anyway, that's what I have to say about maintenance on an old fiberglass sailboat. Don't let it deter you from buying one because you're going to have to do the same thing on a newer boat. So, 
That's just the way it is. Yeah, so if you like this, please give me a thumbs up. And if you haven't, why don't you consider subscribing to my channel and maybe even go hog wild and click that notification bell. Thanks for watching.